Well, it's great because now it, comics can be anything. I Art Spiegelman is the father of modern American comics. When he was a kid, comic books were considered as illicit as pornography. But for Spiegelman, comics were like literature, where you could speak about the unspeakable, like Mouse. His groundbreaking graphic novel that tells the story of his parents' survival under the Nazis, portraying Jews as mice and Nazis as cats. It's considered by many to be the first true graphic novel. It won Spiegelman a Pulitzer Prize and helped turn comics from low art into high art. It's the work most people know of mine. It's work, the only work I ever spent 13 years on. He was soon hired at The New Yorker, where his covers were courageous and sometimes outrageous, sharing many of the principles of his colleagues at Charlie Hebdo. Well, comics were seen as a dangerous su substance to be controlled because they would turn kids into juvenile delinquents. As somebody who was shaped by the comics, I didn't see that as a problem. I wanted to make comics of one kind or another. And fortunately for me, I came of age at a moment where this thing, a phenomenon happened, underground comics. It was part of the uh, anti-war, anti-Vietnam War movement, of the uh, invention of the pill and the sexual revolution that came with it, and massive infusions of psychedelics and grass into the culture. And it changed the people making the comics and the comics that were made. Do you think that comics are still subversive? They can be. I'm afraid that I might have helped domesticate them in ways that I'm apologizing for wherever I go, because as a lower middle class kid, I was interested in where high art and low art smash up against each other and wanted to be uh, invited places I had no business being, like the AGO. <laughs> so you think you've domesticated comics? Is well, I'm afraid that for some people it seems to be the case, and I'm, I'm all for comics being as uh, vulgar and nasty as they can be, as well as uh, as sophisticated as they can be. Well, everyone says now that you're sort of the, the father of the graphic I know, and I've been asking for a paternity test ever since. <laughs> you don't like that? I don't like the phrase because it's... Uh, but it works. I mean, if you just, it depends what you mean by it. I mean, I've seen things that are called graphic novels. All they are is a bunch of stapled superhero stories bound together in one volume. If you think of graphic novel as uh, an ambitious comic book, then maybe that's all right. <laughs>
I just, or I didn't think about it. It was cauterized. And you as it, opened it up here. And then when it flooded back into me, I stopped everything else I was working on, which was much more trivial. Was doing this not even knowing if I'd let it get published anywhere. Uh, but started making a comic that didn't look like other comics around me at uh, all. Uh, you got a lot screwing of mother, his mother. Father stuff I do, in your don't you? Comics. Oh, in my comics, but comics, in my life. Not in my life oh. as uh, an open book. And it's a book that includes a lot of mother and father <laughs> stuff, I would imagine, if you dig. No, I'm, I'm different than other people. Oh, really? Okay, no mother and just born under a cabbage leaf. <laughs> I'm doing the interview of you. <laughs> I'm letting you, <laughs> Mom. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> um, no, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Duh. Anyway, this was about um, uh, killing one's father, screwing one's mother is basic okay. subject matter. This was even more perverse. Uh, so this, this is about this child is the one you're not proud of. I'm not necessarily proud of it, but this was in, the, in keeping with the kind of underground comics that were around me in terms of its ins inspirations and influences, in terms of something about the crowded drawing style, that too many, lots of lo decorative yeah. uh, patterns and lines. That was in keeping with a lot of the underground comics. I did. I was invited in at a time where By Tina Brown. I had a new editor, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, who had very little respect for the New Yorker's tradition and was looking to liven that was things a good up. Thing. It's a good thing for me, yeah, because uh, it allowed me to do these covers that were uh, not always, but occasionally rather. Uh, yeah, I remember this one. Yeah, that was the one that started off the possibility of making controversial covers in the magazine. What did you want to? Well, that was stir up uh, with that. Well, it was you know I didn't even know what I was stirring up, and I didn't know how stirred things could get because this was before the internet. Um, so this was in the wake of the Crown Heights riots. I'd just been invited into the magazine. Crown Heights was a neighborhood in Brooklyn where there was uh, uh, race riots between the Hasidic Jewish community and the West Indian African American community that was turning into a bloodbath. It was tragic. So that led to this image of them kissing and making up. Uh, and I had no idea it was going to create that kind of an uproar. And it really was... People uh, were upset? People were really upset all over the world for some reason. It really like became uh, the first internet scandal of this kind, you know? Uh, Why before were an internet. upset? Ah, let's see, Jews were upset because, as I was told, uh, a Hasidic Jew is not even allowed to touch his wife in public. Uh, and blacks were upset, I was told, on a radio show where somebody was yelling at me who's a reverend in the Crown Heights community. If you had any guts, you'd have shown a black man kissing a white lady, a Jewish lady, a white Jewish lady. I remember that one. Tell me the story. Obviously, it's 9-11. Yeah, the New Yorker cover. Well, my wife, Francoise, is the art editor of the New Yorker in charge of the covers. And we were both living, are both living, about 10, 12 blocks away from uh, where the World Trade Center was. Wow. And when we were out in the street that morning, a plane went into that building, and we were watching it as we were on our way to vote in a Democratic primary. This picture of a black-on-black -black image resulted, because I kept going back and forth between house and studio, and as soon as my back was to the towers that you could always see from either place, I couldn't believe they were still gone. So it was like phantom limb. I would turn mm. around, they weren't there. So this somehow, whichever way we wrestled it into existence with each other, is the black on black cover of dealing with that phantom limb of something that's both there and not there, depending mm. on how the light hits it. Mm. So seeing how uh, I was then stuck with trying to deal with the theme of um, what does one understand through media? What does one understand directly? And I became very resentful of it all being reduced to a war recruiting poster within two weeks. So what are you mad at now? Mad at now? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm heartbroken. Like, uh, whatever the little whispers of an ideal America that we aimed toward once might have been uh, that had me actually at my most uh, weepy sentimental when Obama won the election, a uh, little voice told me, a uh, friend's voice actually saying, prepare to be disappointed. And are you? Uh, yes. <laughs> but what are you going to do? I mean, you've done all of these retrospectives. For I'm always a wondering, years. but usually, you know, everything that I've been doing, after each one of the major pieces, I collapse and don't think I'll ever do anything else, and then something rallies and pushes something else into existence. So you got an idea for it? I have some ideas. It's been a real pleasure to meet you. <laughs> Thank Wendy, you so much. Thanks Eric. so much. Bye-bye. Thank
After the attacks at Charlie Hebdo, we got back in touch with Art Spiegelman to get his reaction. He referred us to an article he wrote years ago when people were killed for the Danish cartoon Mocking the Prophet. Spiegelman was defiantly in favour of all cartoonists' freedom to express whatever they want.